Welcome to the SAG After Foundations Conversations at Home program. I'm Carla Sosenko. Before we're joined by our guest today, I wanted to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given nearly $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you're a SAG after artist and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce writer director, Lauren Hathaway and actor Isabel Furman of The Novice. Hello. 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 How are you both doing today? I'm uh, good, good. It's exciting to, to, to finally put this film out into the world after four and a half years for, for myself. So, wow. Ready. Yeah. Wow. I was same. Very, very excited. So let's go back. So the, the film. So first of all, Lauren, this is your you, you've worked in the film industry for a long time, but this is your feature debut as a writer director. And it premiered at Tribeca where it won Best Actress for Isabel. Best Cinematography, and the Founders Award for Best U.S. Narrative Feature, which for a debut film, I mean, has to be mind-blowing. For, for Really for both of you, especially, I guess, kind of in the context of the pandemic, what what have the past few months been like for you with this film? Um, I mean, for me, because this was rough in the sense that doing post-production in my kitchen in uh, 2020 with, um, you know, my roommates cooking behind me and you have no idea if film festivals are going to exist, if there's going to be theaters, if the world's going to even exist and working in this black box. I mean, Rebecca was the first time that I saw the film with an audience of more than two people. Um, and it was bizarre and it was lovely. And obviously to get that reception, especially after the sort of uh craziness of, of 2020 was it was great and then since then i mean my goal really this was my blood sweat and tears kind of investment i, I want to keep making films i want to i love sound i uh, love post-production sound if i have to go back to that career it's a great kind of backup career but i i want to keep making films and i you know hopefully it seems like I might have that opportunity so it's been great for me yeah well so one of the things i wonder if people watching right now may know this or not but even if they don't know it they might sense it that this film is based on your own experience as a college rower. And um, I'm wondering, Isabel, when you, as an actor, is there an added challenge when you know that you're playing the experience, a very specific real experience of someone and that person happens to be standing right next to you <laughs> and is directing you? You know, it was something that I was very aware of, but I, I don't know if I really thought about it beyond after our first time sitting down and meeting. I mean, Lauren was there every step of the way. So what I loved is anytime I had a question, I could ask her, but, um, you know, Lauren did such a great job of actually kind of immersing me in the world of rowing. I rode the entire movie. I didn't have a double. So she was adamant that I do like in very intense training. I learned how to row. I mean, I was like waking up at 4.30 in the morning and rowing for six hours and then would drive in traffic and eat like my second breakfast of the day and go work out and lift weights for an hour. I mean, I got to really transform in this role and I got to go through very similar experience that Lauren did in, in college. I mean, hers was obviously four years experience. Mine was like, you know, six weeks and then they shoot. So I was asking her questions from everything from like what to do when my blisters and my hands were bleeding and like, you know, how, how like she felt waking up in the morning because I was getting exhausted and she did this for four years. And then even kind of down to even the more emotional beats in the film, when Alice kind of starts to kind of fall in on herself, um, you know, there were certain experiences that I myself hadn't really gone through in terms of, you know, um, the harm that she inflicts on herself. And Lauren was was really uh, valuable to explain to me what that was like and how she wanted it to feel. And so, you know, it was really like a valuable resource, but it wasn't something I consciously thought of on a daily basis. I think it would have probably driven me crazy if I did. Yeah. Um, but uh, luckily for me, like, it's almost like I could ignore it and remember it at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, I imagine if you're actually living it, you're actually kind of training as a rower would train that, I mean, people throw around the, the term method a lot, but it does feel like that is 
kind of at least for the the physical stamina portion of it and and i and i guess the mental stamina part too you would have no choice but to really feel that role yeah you know it's it's a cool thing to, to, to think like, you know, you read a script and you're like, wow, this is so exciting. I'm going to, you know, get to learn and understand the sport. And, and, it, and it's as an actor, it's like everything that you hope for. And, and I'm personally, the way that I work is I like to do a lot of prep beforehand and then go into like a shoot and just be able to kind of be present and be in the moment. Um, and I don't know if that has something to do with the fact that I do theater and have done it in the past as well, that that sort of helps me kind of sit within the character and just allow the character to kind of grow within me, to grow with her, to grow with the experiences around me and allow it to take its own shape during the shooting process because everything changes once you start filming. Um, and with this movie, it's like I had six weeks to train and our first week up was water week, which was all of the race sequences and all of the rowing. And so I, in my mind was like, okay, like I'm getting in physical shape and gaining this muscle to look like a rower for the entirety of the movie. But the rowing, I really only have to do to like train for that first week. And I remember getting, you know, finishing water week, barely. I mean, we, Lauren can talk more about that, but it was, it was a really, really tough week. And I was so physically exhausted. I think I slept until like four o'clock in the afternoon on the one day off that I had, which was Sunday. And I remember waking up to go to the gym and realizing that this level of exhaustion was where I needed to be emotionally for the entirety of the shoot. And so I made a conscious decision to continue rowing in the tank and to continue like rowing on the erg in the, in the gym on top of like the physical weights that I was doing just to kind of have the aesthetic look that I wanted for the, for the film. Um, and, and that level of exhaustion really put me in this um, pocket that I think we find Alex in, which is like, you know, she's like an open wound walking around a lot of the time. And, and that's what I felt like very much working on this movie. Yeah. I, and I, I think viewers feel that too. I know I certainly did. Um, Lauren, you, you know, said that this film was a catharsis for you. I'm wondering though, if it was also triggering, if there, if there were, if there's a flip side to that, if, if, you know, I mean, art can absolutely be cathartic for the artist, but I, I'm just wondering if it was also hard <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've adopted this motto lately because you have to laugh at life sometimes to keep from crying and sometimes you're crying too, but it's like the worst case, it makes for a good story. Um, but uh, yeah, it was because the first draft of the script I wrote in July, 2017, and I was in a really good place in my life and I was kind of on top of the world in terms of relationships, career, all of that. And we shot this film October, November, 2019. And I had done the last kind of revision. There's a countless drafts in between that, but the last revision right before that, and, you know, I took my four years of, of collegiate rowing and compressed it down into a year for this film. But I also took essentially 10 years of coming of age and compressed it down into this film. And a lot of the more emotional beats for the film, like the breakup, the, the sort of the, the self-harm scenes, a lot of these things were pulled from things that were happening to me between the first draft and the, the final draft. And to and I was constantly infusing more and more of that into the script and it became this catharsis on that level as well. And so... It was difficult. It was difficult to put that in there. It was difficult, I think, more so to to share these things. And Isabel kind of mentioned this uh, a minute ago, but like there's a particular scene like she couldn't she didn't have anything to pull from from that. And, and uh, you know, I had to pull me aside and, and also just being very aware of like the sound guy's always listening. You know, he's always listening and you're having this, this intense conversation with this actor about these very, very, very vulnerable moments in your life and knowing that the sound guy is listening and recording potentially and, and that the, the producers, everyone can kind of hear these conversations. So it's this, you know, it, is, it does feel like an open wound of opening this stuff and exposing yourself to everyone. But the thing that I found that's found really rewarding about this from every stage is that those, those scenes that are the hardest to write, that they're hardest to shoot, the hardest to talk about are the ones that people tend to connect to the most and kind of, Realizing that, um, you know, made things, uh, I wouldn't say easier per se, but but made it okay and made it worth it. And yeah, and then there was a scene, the, the sort of scene towards the end of the film with her and Danny in the bathroom. And, and that was a close set and watching that scene from the, the, from the next room and, and kind of brought me, because that was something that I kind of wrote in in a later draft, like that got me, it was very emotional. We were all on the floor afterwards crying <laughs> and uh you know, but then having Isabel, I feel like through this process, we had a real friendship, a real relationship, a real everything. I mean, it's, uh, and I think too, having made this film and, and something getting older, as I've gotten older, valued relationships in a way that when I was sort of the Alex doll of my life, uh, very clinical and sort of discarded. So, yeah. 
I mean, I, the, the scene that you're talking about, I, I think for me too, having, I, I mean, you, you live this experience for me, I'm just watching as a viewer, but for me, that was also the most emotional scene, even though plenty of scenes were, were tough to watch. And, and we, you know, I just wanted to like, stop you and say, sit, <laughs> you have something to eat, like let someone hug you. But that scene I think was, was one of the very few times, if not the only times where we, we see Alex really drop her guard and, and be vulnerable for even just like a couple minutes. It's really not very long, but that was really, um, that was the moment where, you know, you've said in, I, I've, I've read that you've said that like, this is a sports movie and it's not a sports movie. And I think that, you know, that's really, you get it throughout, but when you're like, yeah, no, this is a human, this is a human movie. This is someone who is driven by something that maybe she doesn't even understand. I don't, what do you, what do you think about that? I know Lauren, you've said that you, crew, crew was just like the thing. It came out of nowhere. You were not a, a, a high school athlete. Like how, I'm wondering from, from both of your perspectives, how you connect that, Isabel, I guess, in terms of like how you do your character work and, and motivation, like it's so, that is such an interesting thing that I feel like we have not seen before where somebody has this level of obsession, but it's kind of random. Yeah, I mean, Lauren has spoken about this a lot. It's like, you know, this, and I remember reading the script and what I loved about it is I love movies about obsession and, and I've seen, You've, we've all seen them before. We all know those people in our lives. I mean, I personally am one of those people when I get really involved in something, I become like obsessed and really driven to achieve it and to do like the very best that I can. And what I loved about this movie is it touched on something that I personally experienced was like, I don't know where my drive comes from in my life. It doesn't come from parents that have pushed me in a certain direction and it doesn't come from people around me or from wanting to prove something to somebody else. I have always had this since I was a kid and I don't know where it comes from. And so what I loved about the script is, it, you know, Alex's story is that she's the villain and she's the hero of her own story. There's no external force driving her. It's her, you know, it's like a character study. You dive into her head as an audience member and you live that anxiety of what it's like to essentially fall in love with this sport to the point that it turns toxic and that she kind of collapses in on herself and like to what degree she will go in order to succeed and achieve her goal, regardless of everyone around her telling her how great she's doing. And so for, for me, I, I really connected with that deeply. And, and that really was something that made me want to be a part of this film, want to tell this story. And, and even, you know, from working on this film and watching the, the movie and seeing it now, I mean, I, I don't know where that comes from and I don't have an answer to that question. And I think that's what's really powerful about our movie and, and different and what makes it stand out. Yeah. Lauren, has that coalesced at all for you in, in the years that you've been working on this film, like in, in your own reflection of that time in your life where, how that happened, how for you rowing <laughs> became the thing? Well, I mean, Isabel was talking about this too, because I, I love these obsessed, um, you know, the obsessed artists, films and but I that there's always this external thing that's happening there's there's a coach there's a there's a overbearing mother there's the trying to go to the Olympics just trying to do all of that when I was a collegiate rower no one half the people at our school didn't even know we had a rowing team we weren't even winning the regional races like I'm I'm tall for a woman but I'm very short for a rower I'm never going to the Olympics like I was I was always the second worst person on my my um, you know youth sports teams growing up um, but I still had this drive to, to do it. And I don't really know where it, it came from. I think it's a mix of nature and nurture and these subtle things and psychology and all of this. But I also think, um, you know, I grew up in a small Texas town. I was a little redneck kid, but I've never been religious, even if that was always around me. And it wasn't it was this very cliche thing. You know, I was 20 years old. I had a college class and I discovered existentialism, which for me blew my my fucking my mind. And, uh, you know, nihilism, crudely put, which most people I think are more familiar with, is this idea that life has no meaning and existential and very simply put, life has no meaning, you give it meaning. And I think the thing I've learned about myself so sort of through uh, neurotic self-analysis is like this idea that, you know, it's like the shark has to keep swimming or it sinks. And um, for me, I find purpose in challenge and doing things for the sake of doing things. Um, and I think, you know, Alex is a proxy of me is that as well. And she finds she has the rowing becomes her challenge for this moment for this film, like this is where she's done. And, and by the end of the film, you know, it's, it's kind of like what's going to be next and, and joking with Isabel all the time, there could be a, you know, a novice too. Alex gets a, an internship or Alex gets a, her first job and 
sort of diving in. And certainly in my life, I've had that kind of obsession and I've tried to find the balance. And I think I've sort of accepted that it's all or nothing for me. And it's just about having pockets of the all in and having the pockets of living the good life and kind of trying to find balance in that way. But um, yeah, and and I'm okay with that. And I I find my purpose in that and achievement in that. And I've learned to sort of stack my, um, you know, my, my things like this kind of checkerboard them, because I think anyone working in our industry, we all have this sick feeling of you you're all in on a project whether you're acting directing writing you get to the end and then it's over and summer camp's over and you're going back home to your apartment or whatever and your plants are all dead and, and you've got nothing and you don't know it's in that cold kind of vapid feeling um dealing with that is rough and whether you do it in your work your your um relationships whatever i think most people have related to that on some level and it's kind of the thing the where i am now in my life is just a sort of stoic of rolling with it, knowing, and this is a joke we had on set too, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. For every good thing that was coming, there's something horrible right around the corner. And for every clusterfuck that was happening, we just try to get through it and know that, you know, something else was coming around. So it's kind of this um, being mindful about it and just being present and just rolling with the punches, as they say. What were the, what were those, what would, what did the Lord taketh? When oh you go- God, the Lord taketh oh. so many things. <laughs> um, well, because our first week was water week and anyone knows and working in the industry, children, animals and water are the three most horrendous things to be dealing with. And my <laughs> first week as a director was water week. And the first thing we shot was the foggy row and it's beautiful. And I, it was like perfect. perfect. And I was like, I'm meant to be a director. I'm brilliant. Like this is a piece of cake. This is going to be the easy. Bird that literally flew across the frame that we didn't even hire. Like it just did that. But like the, I remember I was like in the boat, I was just like, wow, if the whole shoot is like this, we're like, this shoot is blessed. Like someone <laughs> is smiling on us, cut to like hours later. And we were two days behind, like on the say, already two days behind a day into the shoot. And I was sitting like the third morning of the shoot. We we're switching tonight, sitting on the floor of this linoleum floor of catatonic. Like I am, how the fuck are we going to finish this movie in 21 days? And I was researching I like quotes from, from Damien Chazelle around making whiplash and all these other directors too. But I found something from him that he said that making that film every day felt like walking the tightrope between something, making something really beautiful and utter crushing disaster. And I'm like, that's exactly, we're right on track. And the last, the final race, we shot it over the course of three days and the city opened the dam to drain all the water out of the lake or river, whatever it was, did not tell us they were doing it. So all the boats are getting sucked down the river um, you have the five boats in the shop, plus the safety boat, the sound boat, the light boat, the taxi boat, the house boat, the camera boat. So there's bumper boats happening. It's freezing cold. The actors can't even feel their things. They're all facing. And backwards. we're rowing backwards, meaning like we're we're using the oars the opposite direction to stay in the same place so we can shoot from the same place. So we're not all sucked down this thing. Amy Forsythe oh is wearing this raven head and literally is just like, we're all like, Amy, Amy, Amy. And she's like, what? What's happening? She can't see. And she's like crashing into a tree. And she's like, I'm crashing into a fucking tree someone has to tell me i mean it was literally like we, we were all just like how is this gonna happen how are we gonna do this yeah and if any one of them would have gone in the water um we would have had it, we wouldn't have finished the thing because it would have taken so long to reset them just to, to ferry them back to dry them off to get them back in the boat to flip the boat to to, to bail it out and those boats are so topsy like they really do flip quite easily and Very you don't know isabel but i was like do you fucking Isabel don't go on don't you fucking flip that boat don't you flip that boat don't, I was just like praying like don't flip don't flip don't flip don't flip um and we survived it, it happened and then there's also the haunted warehouse we shot in there was a carbon monoxide leak there was an explosion um you know just classic, classic. yeah you know yeah but you know you roll with the punches I mean there were a lot of things that I think you know Lauren would speak to this more so but like there were a lot of things that went wrong that created new um, opportunities for some really beautiful things to happen. And I think like it also helped, you know, weirdly, like, you know, the style of the film, I think is so perfect because at times it felt like how we were filming it. It emotionally felt like where I was at, like as I was performing it. And I feel like, you know, even Lauren's like pandemic experience editing it felt similarly too. like, and, you know, the, and, and even um, even Alex West, who did her score, said that he purposefully wanted the, the 
you know, the musicians to play like, you know, really rapidly. And some of them had their fingers cutting and, and bleeding on the strings. And like, we, I think captured in every single element, like whether we meant to or not, the sort of level of urgency and anxiety that we were all kind of feeling as we were like really passionately telling the story. Yeah. One, something you just said I, reminded me and I, I'm not sure why, but um, the dynamic of the women on the team, right? So this is this is very much a, a film populated by women. There there are men in it too, but but really other kind of than the coach. We're not. This is. It feels like a a, a, a woman centric movie. And and one of the things that I thought was fascinating and just so real was was um, there's a sort of teamsmanship in 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 some way, and then in another way, it's incredibly adversarial and and. Alex has virtually no support and certainly doesn't really give any support either. And I, I'm wondering if, you know, I, I think that women, we, we are, um, or I, I think that in my own experience, it's sometimes we're um, set up to be that way, right? To, to I mean, it, it, to compete against the, the people who are on your own team. And I'm wondering how, I, I think there were actual rowers that were were you were working with, but also obviously actors. And and how did that dynamic? Obviously, you know, you have your your kind of main nemesis, but your Al, Alex is pretty much on her own um, on this team. And I'm wondering if if there was how that dynamic developed. Is that just something that you're able to turn on and off as actors, or was there something? Was it was part of going through what sounds like a very difficult shoot? Did that add to the tension and and kind of what we see happening? You know, it's funny, Amy Forsyth and I have known each other for a long time and I've been dying to work with her. So I was so excited to work with her also to like see her in this role because she usually plays like such beautiful, like feminine, very nice girls. And she in this movie is like such a bro, which I really loved. And like every day, I mean, like, if, if I can describe filming with Amy, it was like every day I was like, gosh, she's so incredible. <laughs> like, she's so good. Like when we were doing the, the scene in the car where I'm like, you know, upset about not being like the first choice to be on varsity. I remember I really was like, I really can't listen to anything she's saying because I thought she was so funny. I mean, Lauren had to get out of the car because she's like, oh my God, I'm a fun in your mural. Ducks. Like I was, I was in stitches laughing and I, I really was like, you know, Working on the movie, I would say like the competition and the team dynamic for me, Alex always felt like she was in her own kind of world and her own sort of bubble. Like, you know, I think you you see that she has like, you know, you think that she has a sort of like competition with Jamie, but I didn't ever feel like it was like a competition necessarily with Jamie. With Jamie, it's more like, you know, here she is faced and haunted by yet again, another person who is naturally gifted at something and is, you know, the right height for a rower, the right look for a rower. And Alex doesn't have any of that. And so it's more so not necessarily quite a competition with Jamie. It's a competition against somebody naturally gifted, like going against what your nature is to stand up to the challenge and push through it. And I think, you know, to me, I mean, I didn't feel any tension with Amy. I freaking love Amy. And then, you know, all of the other women on set, I mean, we really just bonded. I think when you're, you know, in the freezing cold in a boat for hours on end and then like, you know, those boats, like it's not like, you know, that was a bonding experience for all of us. Like, you know, we're out in the middle of the water and we're all on separate boats. And like, yeah, I have a walkie docky to talk to Lauren when she needs to like direct the scene. You know, people are telling us where to go, but in between setups, you know, I'm, you know, we're sitting in the boat and like, what are we going to do? We're just talking like girls and hanging out. And, you know, it, I really felt like we bonded as a team, especially the rowers from Trent University. They were incredibly supportive to Amy and I who learned to row for this film and are put in a boat with them. And so much of how you keep the boat upright is a, is a team dynamic and is setting the boat properly and all of that stuff. We were like, just like, like literally novices learning, like, like just like these little like freshly hatched ducklings, like just trying to make it work. And they were so incredibly supportive. And this whole competition actually narrative was so funny because I living in Alex's world didn't ever think about it as much. And watching the movie for the first time, I remember that being one of the first things that I actually noticed was seeing how all of these women have their own fight that they're fighting and they're all doing it differently. Like the coach is kind of like, 
trying to make her team better, even though it's not like the best team. Nobody really at the school knows they have a rowing team. You know, then you have Amy, who's like fighting for that scholarship because it's, you know, not necessarily because she loves this sport, but because it makes it, it's going to make her life easier that she needs the scholarship, you know. And then you have the seniors who are kind of like just fighting to get out of there because they're just done with it. And then like Aaron's character, who's like, you know, wants that, you know, that better spot in the varsity than this in the V1 boat, but she's not going to fight for it. And so there is this interesting dynamic where you kind of see how all of these women have their own battles. And it's not necessarily that they're pitted against each other. It's just that they're kind of like these crossing lines that they don't even realize are there. Um, but the team dynamic was something Lauren and all of the other girls did. I mean, I was really like, I was just like in my own kind of like bubble. And then we would like hang out outside of, outside of the scenes and that sort of thing when I could not be like the creature that I am as Alex. <laughs> is that, as someone who's not an actor, I'm always fascinated. Is it easy to leave that behind? Like, is it easy to make that switch when you come out of that and you're like, let's go get a beer or something, you know? It's easy and not. It's like a combination of the two. I would say that whenever you play these characters, you're, you, you know, you take them home with you. I don't, I, I don't consciously ever have ever considered myself a method actor and I, and I wouldn't, but I, I think that you embody a person and you spend your like majority of your time in their head, thinking through their insecurities, thinking through their problems, thinking through their emotions and and it rubs off on you. And, you know, I think I do a good job playing pretend that it's not affecting me. I mean, like I knew that this movie, especially like Lauren said, Lord give it, the Lord taketh. Like there were so many things that were up and down. And, and I knew that if I was like cold and miserable and everyone looked at me, you know, as a, is number one on the call sheet is like the, you know, the lead of the movie, everyone looks to you to set an example in a sense. And I've known that since I was really little, since I worked on Orphan, like I've worked with actors and watched them do that. And to be in the shoes to do that, really you, you become aware that like, if I was smiling and having a good time, even though everything was falling apart, like there were moments where like, I could literally hear Ryan Hawkins, our producer be like, Isabel looks fine. Like, at least she's okay. You know, like there, there are moments where like, I was like, okay, if I can make one person at least feel like, you know, things are all right right now, that's like good enough for me. Um, and then I would just go home at, and, you know, at night and I would take a scalding hot bath to like remind myself that like, I was still here. Isabel's still here. I'm okay. Life is good. And, 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 and it's like those moments that I had to myself. So I would say it, it is a balancing act. I, I don't necessarily feel like you really can actually lose a character ever that you play with. Um, I think you take things from each one that you play and you learn things and it actually helps you grow as a person. So it really took me, I would say actually until you know this last year, I was spending a lot of time sitting at home that I actually learned the lesson that I feel like Alex <laughs> starts to learn in this movie. And that was, you know, self-reflection kind of looking back on this film because I had such a incredible time making it that I was kind of thinking back on you know <laughs> fond memories <laughs> and then I was like oh wow what a what a good thing to to take away from this yeah it's interesting that you you talk about that because something Lauren I've heard you you mentioned Whiplash which you worked on um and you 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 kind of you talk a lot about Whiplash and Black Swan in terms of um films that you've kind of found inspiration in and, and that you really respect. And, and um, with the difference being that um, Alex doesn't triumph at the end. And I wanted to ask about that because when Alex erases her name from the board, I was like, yes. I was like, to me, I felt like, I guess I triumph would be overstating it, but there was like this sliver of hope for her. Mm -hmm. You know, just yeah, I mean, it, it is supposed to be, I think this is like, we learn her, her high school experience that she basically only quit what she was doing in high school because she was forced to, like, because high school ended and these other things happened to her. And then in college, you know, she's sort of leveling up this coming of age aspect of the, of the film is at the end, she, she chooses to step away. That is growth. I mean, she got to this very dark place in the final shot of the film and we see her body, we see the kind of the, the scars and we see the, 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 the blood thing and, and kind of her exhaustion and it like she she walked away before before it quite literally would have killed her but 
it is that that sort of bittersweet and i'd like to think that she would kind of keep growing and 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 um progressing and and i think too i mean the thing that i've had to learn i think this character has to learn i think anyone has to learn as they're coming of age is winning to learn learning when to let things go because no one cares about you as much as you care about you no one is really thinking about you in that regard and like as much as Alex is is internally driven and doing this stuff for herself, I think part of it is too is like you is, there is a little bit of ego in it. There is a little bit of you know she's not competing directly against Jamie, but Jamie is this benchmark she's using of the naturally gifted, and so she has to like let some of that go. So it is kind of it's meant to be this bittersweet. I also wanted to feel a little bit like um, you know the, the spinning top at the end of Inception. Like uh, you know I've had people say to me quite confidently that they, they seem to know what time she wrote on the board or, or they seem to have a, this, this idea in their head of, it, of what happened and other people think something the opposite happened. And that's intentional. Like me and me and Isabel, we know the answer. Like I, I know the answer, but I don't, I will never tell anyone. Like I want people to go into this sub subjective experience um, and take out of it what they will, you know? Um, but it is bittersweet for sure. And I think I, some of that bittersweetness or the other side of that bittersweetness. And I'm, I'm wondering if this is just because we live in such a hustle culture and a grind <laughs> and, a, and a burnout culture that there, there were also moments in the film when Alex was pushing herself. And even though she was breaking down right in front of us, we could see it. You were, you know, obviously the cinematography, the music, everything kind of shifts throughout the film. And we're kind of going down this rabbit hole with Alex. I still was thinking like, you keep going. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of the way Lauren told the story. It's like you, you, like, like I said, she's the villain and the hero of the story, Alex is. So you as an audience member kind of join this roller coaster ride with her. And at the beginning, you're like, you're begging for her to succeed. You want her to succeed. You're watching her and you're like, go for it, go for it, go, go for it. And like you said, it's like this, you know, this American hustle culture and especially like when it comes to like, you know, ath athletics and, you know, even college too. I mean, college students experience that a lot. You're kind of rooting, rooting, rooting for her. And then it's only when you kind of realize that it, you tipped too far over the edge and you haven't even realized it happened that you're like you were saying, you're like, sit down, have a snack, relax. You know what I mean? That, and, and that's what I find so so cool about this movie and like Lauren said this like you finish the movie and some people are inspired <laughs> weirdly and some people leave this movie and are just like oh my gosh what the hell is that it's crazy yeah and I would say too the one interesting thing that I didn't pick up on until after in talking to press people who aren't from the U.S. is there's been people commenting about how American this film is and as someone who just recently moved out of America too, I guess I see it. I mean, that is a really interesting aspect. And you even just mentioned it. It's like this American hustle culture and I wasn't aware of it, but obviously I'm a product of my environment and what have you, but it is like, this isn't, and even, even the fact that Alex is an individual, she's on a team, but she's so individualistic. And this is something that I am guilty of too. Like, I don't know what that says about our culture or, or what have you. And, and maybe the blessing and the curse of the pandemic, it, it is making us reevaluate kind of hustle culture and, and the work-life balance in a way that we never have before, which is really interesting and totally unintentional, but absolutely exists within this film. Yeah. I think, which is also partly why seeing Alex have an albeit brief, but healthy, loving relationship was like for us, the tiniest little breath of air that we got because we we're like okay <laughs> at least she gets this for a for a minute you know and then of course yeah and Danny was meant to be too I mean the, the way we shot the scenes with Danny and everything everything else is very sort of stark cold or or kind of claustrophobia and jaundicey feeling scenes with Danny are warm and everything we did with the production design with the character with whatever it's warmth and it was important to me too to show that Alex isn't just purely this creature like she has the capability to step in and be a human and, and be this but she chooses not to and yeah. she has people and I also wanted to make it clear like this the thing about, I mean, obviously mental health is a huge thing this day and age and everyone's like, oh, get help, seek help, ask for help. I mean, that's easy to say, but the reality of someone who's, who's prone to serious depression and these different things is you have to want to do it. You have to want the help. You have to want to like go out and seek this. She has someone very loving who's been through this trying to encourage her and she's pushing her away, um, which says, I mean, I don't know what that says either about our culture for say, but I think things are so much more complex than we really um you know, we really want to believe, unfortunately. I mean, it did make me think very much about mental health services on college campuses, because I think that that's something that really um, 
there are schools where, um, you know, just I, I know from personal experience from hearing stories that there's, I, I was waiting. I was waiting for somebody to notice, for a coach to notice or somebody to say this, this person needs help. And, and really Danny's the only one that does. And um, everybody else thinks she's psychotic, you know? That, that I mean, like, the thing too that's interesting is because I've had people from my rowing team, even the rowing coach that kind of inspired me to write Coach Pete, actually say to me, like, I didn't know, were you going through this? I had no idea you were going through this. Like, and even when I was in, and I, and tell them, don't worry, I, this is like four years and 10 years. It's, it's, it's not all, this wasn't all that experience, but um, I think that we are, and I even thought that what I was experiencing when I was that collegiate rower, that everyone else was having the same experience. I think we naively assume when, especially the younger we are, that everyone thinks and feels and is experiencing things just the way that we are. And when I was getting ready to shoot this film, I asked um, the character sort of who inspires a, a air in the cox. And I was like, what did everyone think of me when I was back then? And she's like, everyone thought you were fucking psychotic. And I was like, oh, I thought it was, it felt normal to me. But like, you know, you, people think you're psychotic, but they also, you know, you think you're normal. And also people had no idea what you're going through because you can hide it. So it's like, how easy is this, is this stuff, you know, how easy is it to see these things or isn't it? Like, I don't think people are much more complex and nuanced creatures um and there's all of us have have layers and layers and layers yeah yeah and even when you see that scene where coach pete walks in on alex in the erg room i mean that was something that i i purposefully felt like you know that was a scene where you had to see alex being a little bit more you know not not just human more fun like you know kind of like herself and and as a coach you know i think any coach would would want their athletes to have you know, a drive to be better and, and want to succeed and want to continue pushing themselves. And, and, and I think it makes sense sometimes that people don't notice those things because, you know, even coach Edwards is like, this is the dedication that she wants. So that's like the praise from Alex for Alex that she'll actually listen to, you know, because the dedication is being rewarded, not necessarily the outcome of it. Right. And so there, there really is, I mean, those are, those are the things that what I actually, I don't even know if Lauren, you did this on purpose. Like those are things that I hear in the movie. And I remember listening to as the actor that are not necessarily the loudest things that you hear. I mean, you hear relax over and over. You hear all of these things that Alex refuses to listen to. But the big things that I hear as the actor, Isabel watching the movie are like those moments where, you know, where she's like, she, you know, she's saying like, this is the kind of dedication I'm looking for, you know, from my athletes, like, let's go. And I, and I think that this is, this is where it kind of comes from is like, you only hear what you want to hear given the situation that you're in. And, you know, I, I think it makes sense. I mean, I, I know from working on this movie, like there were times where I would go home and I would be so exhausted, I'd be crying, but like everyone thought I was smiling and having the best time on set. And I really was, I really was enjoying myself. But at the end of the day, when you give all of your energy, not only to the performance that you're doing, but to the crew and cast around you to make sure that everybody's okay, okay that's an immense amount of energy to expend and when you don't have the adequate time to go home and sleep to gain it back you're really just kind of like running on fumes toward the ends of it and like lauren and i were laughing because like the last week look at photos of the two of us you can't even see the whites of our eyes i mean we were we were so exhausted like i don't even know how we were I don't even know how I was remembering my lines or anything like the last week feels like such a blur like an emotional blur the whole entire thing except for taking a bath with a crab naked that was like seared into my mind because I was so like like I found it hilarious because I was like Lauren am I like getting in the bath with the crab and she's like no and then I was in the bath with the crab <laughs> and with like pasties on and I was just like yeah I wouldn't do this for anybody but Lauren <laughs> I was like I wouldn't do this for anybody but Lauren gosh I love Lauren uh, that sounds like very high praise and <laughs> a huge compliment yeah her and her and Cornelius the crab I mean uh, she did it and that, that thing was feisty but um <laughs> yeah the, I will always cherish the videos from that day that I got behind the scenes so thank you for that <laughs> Isabel I actually saw this video today, Lauren, that made me laugh of you with like our script supervisor, Michaela was coming over and asking Lauren a question. And we had just finished filming that scene where Jamie and I are like eating second breakfast. And Lauren was literally like eating the prop food because we were done using it for the scene. And Michaela's like, what about this, this, this? And Lauren's like, I don't know, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> 
you just get cat you just hit this point of catatonic of this wall of and i mean the thing about directing too is it's just a million decisions even things like do you want a red pen or a blue pen like someone has to make that decision and it's fucking you and the, the, the decision be a fatigue and what you the version you're saying that with isabel with like the being off with the cast and crew too i mean i you obviously the way you treat your crew is so important and, and what you're saying too about like your energy on set we're all freezing our asses off whatever but people are looking to you and, and like well isabel's smiling so maybe it isn't as cold it feels like maybe it's actually fine and meanwhile i'm waking up an hour early to dress ridiculously fashionable but extremely cold and suffering because i mean i feel like it's it's part of like the the, like trying to steer the ship and do these things but yeah you get it's just like every little thing is is it's it's fucking i mean it was 20 hours a day for me as well and like when i got back to to la after we shot i went straight into editing the assembly because i knew as soon as i was done with that i would crash and i did and then the pandemic hit so uh, just added to the 2020 you know, being a great year. Oh. At least 2021 got better. Yeah. That was a joke. Um, it did, though. It did. I mean, it still sucks, but, like, it actually, yes. This says a lot about 2020. It does. It does. <laughs> That's actually true. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you both so much. I, I want viewers to know that The Novice is out on December 17th in theaters and everywhere you rent movies. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, process, and craft. I... I'm so excited for people to see this film. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I love the questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.